Welcome to the League of Women Voters 2014 opening meeting, our 77th year of civic engagement. I'm Marlena O'Brien, president of the League. The League, as you know, I think, is a nonpartisan organization and encourages informed and active participation in government. We influence public policy through education and advocacy and never support or oppose any party or candidate. We have two separate and distinct roles. We present unbiased information about elections, the voting process and issues, and after study, careful, long, consensus-driven study, we use our positions to advocate for or against particular policies. Um, please visit lwvwellesley.org if you'd like more information. A couple of our forthcoming events include um, a holiday party on uh, December 11th. This has become an annual tradition. And if you're interested in joining the League, we'd love to have you at all these events. Most of them are uh, very um, serious and intellectually driven. And then we have some that are more social, such as what I just mentioned. And um, then on December 15th, we have, we're having a book club meeting where we're going to be reading and discussing Destiny of the Republic by Candace Millard. And that will be at the library or in a home. Again, visit lwvwellesley.org for more information. And our fearless leader for our new reading group is here, Joellen Toussaint. You're free to ask her any questions. I will now introduce one of our vice presidents, Anmar Alanza, who's also a trustee of the Wellesley Free Library. And um, Anmar, please come forward. Thank you, Marlena. So I get the pleasure of introducing our speaker for this evening, Victoria Budson. Uh, Victoria is the founding um, executive director of the Women in um, Public Policy program at Harvard uh, Kennedy School. She frequently shares her expertise um, with um, high-level policymakers such as um, the Obama White House, which is wonderful. Um, in addition, she was an, uh, is an appointee of Governor Deval Patrick and chairs the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women. Governor Patrick also appointed her to the Successful Women, Successful Families Task Force in March of 2014. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Victoria has also worked with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and advised the United Nations. In 2014, CNN.com named Victoria one of the top 10 visionary women, and Boston Magazine named her one of the 75 thought leaders um, in their um, power of ideas issue. Closer to home, Victoria grew up here in Wellesley. She graduated magna cum laude um, with departmental honors from Wellesley College with a joint degree in sociology and women's studies. Victoria completed her master's in public administration from Harvard and received the Lucius N. Litauer Fellow Award for distinction in academics, her contribution to the Kennedy School and the greater Harvard community, and her potential for continuing leadership excellence. Victoria still lives here in Wellesley, for which we're all very grateful, um, with her two wonderful children. It is my great pleasure to introduce Victoria Budson. Ann Mara, thank you so much. And for those of you who, of course, know Ann Mara well, she's the only person I know who makes my schedule look completely light. There's no activity I go to where she isn't coming in because she's the chair of something or the head of a committee or the person you go to to talk about something. So it's nice. Wherever I go, there she is. It's been great. And Marlena, thank you so much for opening the event tonight. So we're here to talk about women in politics. I thought I would give an overview and talk a bit about what takes place here in the US, but put it in more of a global context, because it's really hard to understand where we are until you understand where we sit relative to the other countries. And then we can also talk a bit about the midterm elections and what they're likely to mean and what they mean for women. And then in addition, um, though politics is one of my specialties, I work on closing gender gaps on a wide variety of topics, and we can really open it up to anything that we would like to talk about tonight, having to do with women and gender, and we can talk about sort of what the facts and figures are, where you can get further information, and anything else that might be of interest. How does that sound? Good. And we're such a small group, I feel that it's really comfortable if you want to shoot up a hand and ask me a question as we go. 
So first, when we think of the United States, we tend to think of ourselves as a really avant-garde nation in terms of rights. That we're a nation of people who have strong, effective capacity to have freedoms and equal rights, and we think of ourselves as a bastion of democracy, which is predominantly true. But when we think of where those rights are, or where our electoral representation is having to do with women, we can find ourselves in slightly unfamiliar territory. So when we think about the US, the US was founded in 1776. Congress, as we know it, was formed in 1789 with the bicameral legislature. And between all that time to 1920, what couldn't happen? Right, women couldn't vote. In 1920, women got suffrage and my grandmother passed away just a few years ago and she could tell you about the day that women got suffrage. So to put that in context, that you can still sit down and talk to people who can remember that day and were alive during that day. So this isn't 300 years ago or 500 years ago. Um, you know, for example, France. Do people know when the last woman in France got the right to vote? 1944? Yeah, somebody give me the day. Anyone remember? 1971. Right? Good gasping. There should be lots of gasping when we discuss this tonight. People should be shocked. So here in the United States, something very exciting happened during the midterms. What is true about the 113th Congress for the first time in the history of the US? More women. Does anyone know the number? Out of 535 voting, we have 100 women for the first time in the history of the United States including both branches. And in the 114th, we'll have 101 or more. There's a couple races that they're still counting on. Uh, but basically, when one looks at the time period, it's really a pretty brief time period between 1920 and today. But when one looks at how other nations are doing, where does America sit? Does anyone know who is the number one nation on the planet in terms of women's electoral representation. And let's talk about the lower house of parliament that virtually all nations have a larger lower house, so it's the better place to look. So in the United States Senate, we have 20% women, which means we have 20. And in the House of Representatives, I'll do the math for you, we are at 18.2%. Um, but there are nations that do much better. When you look at the Nordic countries, they're up at about 40%. When you look across Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, you're about between 18 and 20 percent. When you look across the Americas, North and South, 25 percent. But here, we're at both houses, we're at about 18 and a half percent. Now, that might not sound so bad, except there's a few facts that go along with that. In the United States, the majority of people to get high school, college, and postgraduate degrees all female. And when we look at Massachusetts, by the way, we have the most highly educated population of women in the entire United States, consistently. Yes, that is worth a clap. <laughs> it's absolutely dynamite. It's absolutely dynamite. And there's a lot of foot in Massachusetts. I had a meeting earlier today with the US Secretary of Labor, Perez, who was in town, along with the Mass Secretary of Labor, uh, Secretary Rachel Caprillion looking at what Massachusetts and Boston are doing. So Mayor, former Menino, and current Mayor Walsh have something called the Women's Workforce Council. And the idea, is anyone familiar with it? Has anyone heard of this? Okay, I'll tell you all about it. So I first heard of it when I was sitting in my doctor's office reading Boston Magazine. I was reading the Mayor's State of the City speech, which is published in there, maybe it was the Globe. I'm reading along. All of a sudden I think, this is really interesting, because at the time, Mayor Menino had been mayor for about 18 years. And I know the people who are active on women's issues within the mayor's office. And it was very much constituency driven and neighborhood driven. And I'm reading this speech and it's data driven. It's all about the data. And he states that he wants to make Boston the best city in the country for working women, and that they want to do things to close the wage gap. And I'm like, this is dynamite. And they're talking about metrics. And I'm like, this is terrific. Someone got it exactly right. Two weeks later, I get a call from a former student named Catherine Lusk. And she said, guess what, Victoria? I'm working for the mayor. 
I said, you are? I said, did you have anything to do with what I just read in the paper? She's like, yeah, they put in my paragraphs. I was like, I could see that. And she said, we're going to do this task force. We're going to figure out how to close the wage gap. And I said, that's great, Catherine. Starting small, I see. Good job. I was like, that's a real pretty big goal to put out there. Nicely done. Uh, and a terrific woman named Catherine Minahan, who'd been head of the Boston Federal Reserve, was asked to chair it, who serves on the MGH board and um, is both very effective civically. She's now one of the deans over at Simmons and is dynamite. And myself, a couple others who work in academic institutions, and then major corporate partners such as State Street. And we looked at all the data on how it is we can close these wage gaps and have put out a white paper, and we asked companies to sign something that we created called the Boston Compact, 100% talent, to really figure out how companies can close the wage gap. Public-private partnership is really the wave of the future for how most rights are going to transfer for women. Um, and this is all sort of backdrop for where we are electorally. So it was Mayor Menino's policy. He was very proud of it, very engaged. But he couldn't do it alone. Good, well-meaning people, which, I've, which I think virtually everybody is, don't wish for there to be a wage gap, but they don't know how to solve it. They think it's too big a problem to solve, and we end up with some of the same issues in political life. Nobody wishes to leave women behind, but it's something that happens repeatedly, which is why it's so important for women to serve in electoral office. So here we are compared to the rest of the world, and we're at about 18.5%. And Asia's at 18%. Sub-Saharan Africa is a little bit, um, uh, it's in the same range. But when I started working on this, I've been at the center for 18 years. I'm one of the original founders. But Sub-Saharan Africa was at almost zero 20 years ago. And Asia was at, you know, single digits. So here we are nearly 20 years later. And they have more than 100% fold increased their women's representation. Guess who hasn't? The US. We really still have a pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Every person can make it on their own. And that's a wonderful, wonderful belief system. But it doesn't make for really effective social change. Now, I, of course, like most people, I'm deeply pickled in my culture. I really like our electoral system. I think it's the best in the world. But it's not likely to produce really different outcomes for women. We're not going to end up with some huge surge from any of the models that are currently created. So what is it that other nations are doing? How are they jumping ahead so quickly? I know someone in the room knows. They're doing structural interventions. They're doing quotas and reserved seats. So Rwanda's number one in the world. They have more than 50% women in their legislature. And they did it because they have reserved seats for women. And they're really smart about it. For seats that were going to definitely go to women, they put in their candidates that they thought would be absolutely spectacular in office, but might be less sparkly campaigners. They put tenacious women who are going to go out there and get the job done running in the seats which weren't reserved. Good strategy. And there's a lot of different mechanisms. Some, um, we have what's called the first past the post system or winner take all system. What does it take in America to get elected? Money. What else? Friends. That's good. Money. <laughs> Very fun. <laughs> Lots of money. But to win in the, in the United States, and you need money for the campaign, you need a large social network, all it takes to win is one more vote than the other person. That's it. That's it. And depending on what office you're running for, there may be some qualifying um, factors, but very few in the US. And I run our political training programs for women at the university. And I do an exercise, which I'm ask, going to ask you each to do. I want you to, a moment, imagine that you're running for office. Even if you never would and it's not something you want to do, just imagine for a minute and think of what office you would want to be in. Joellen, what would you want to be in? I love it. President. Exactly. It's the way to go. Executive office is terrific. There's a lot less of that 
really difficult conversation and compromising. It's good stuff. Irene, what about you? Yes. Mayor. Nice. I always wished Wellesley had a mayor, just because I think it would, what would be more fun than being the mayor of Wellesley? Though, of course, our selectmen do such a wonderful job, and it should stay just as it is. Um, so I want you to now envision, each of you think about an office you'd want to run for, and I want you to envision your opponent. And you're about to go out on stage and debate this opponent. What do you envision when you see your opponent? A man, okay. A white man, what else? A handsome man. Most people, when they envision their opponent, tell me, is this opponent good at anything? What's, what's your opponent good at? Money. Business. Speaking, say it again. Connections. Golf. <laughs> When most people imagine their opponent, they imagine their opponent to have some type of skill or capacity that they feel they don't have. So if someone is a strong debater, they imagine that their opponent is good at something other than debating. If someone feels they're weak in finance, they usually imagine that their opponent would be great at finance. We tend to imagine our theoretical opponent as having strengths where we imagine we have weaknesses. And in reality, when you're running against somebody else, they may be all of the things that you would envision, but chances are they are not. And again, you don't have to be spectacularly good to get elected. You just have to get one more vote than the other person. And one of the things which I always think is worth doing is going and watching C-SPAN for a couple hours. And anyone in this room who watches C-SPAN for two hours and after it feels that they are totally unqualified to run, <laughs> and, and I mean it, seriously, you should call me and we should talk about it. Because one of the incredible things about our electoral system is it is wholly dependent on citizens choosing to lead. We have no other mechanism to govern ourselves. It requires those who are knowledgeable about politics, who study the issues, who are good at consensus-based conversations, to participate. How many of you have run for office of any kind, including town meeting? Yeah. How many of you have run for an office beyond town meeting? Yeah. How many of you haven't yet, but are planning to? I like that. What would you like to run for? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. One of my students just got elected to be a judge from Brooklyn. Yeah. That's great, and that's one of the interesting things also about the United States is we have different systems. So now let's talk for a bit about, well, why does it matter if we have women elected? What's the difference? Why do we actually need to have women elected? Yes. And your name is Tammy? Tommy? I'm trying to read your name tag from here, which, which is a great challenge, but I'm very pleased I could pick out some of the letters. You'll remember I was at the eye doctor when I was reading that article before. Um, so Tommy had a really good point, which is that women have a different perspective. And what we see, both in the US and abroad, is women legislators prioritize slightly differently than their male counterparts. Women prioritize three things in their expenditures. They prioritize education, the environment. By the environment, think clean air, clean water, effective sanitation, not save the spotted owl. You know, energy policy, keeping communities safe, clean, healthy. And we also prioritize healthcare expenditure. Healthcare expenditure. And then the flip side, in addition to the different priorities, is in 
the first version of the Affordable Care Act, does anyone know what was missing? What? And what else? Does anyone know? Every woman over 40 in the United States gets a what? A mammogram. A mammogram. And mammograms and pap smears weren't covered. The two most basic forms of health care that women are to receive. Now, in my view, I don't think anyone consciously meant to exclude women. It's just that even with the number of women up there, when those bills are crafted in committees and the deals are being cut, fewer women in the room. And when, if, we'll use mammograms as an example. Does anyone know one in how many women gets breast cancer in the U.S.? Yep. One in eight. And someone over here had said you need a large social, you need social network, you need a big network to get elected. If you're in Congress, there is no way in your social network you don't know someone personally who's had breast cancer. Mother, sister, daughter, cousin, neighbor, friend, teacher, dry cleaner who's had breast cancer. But in order to make effective policy, you have to extrapolate the needs of others if you haven't walked that life. It is really hard to effectively extrapolate the needs of others. Good, well-meaning people get it wrong all the time. In a perfect world, we shouldn't need what's called descriptive representation. I shouldn't need someone who looks like me or has lived the life that I've led to make policy on behalf of me. Anyone should be able to do it because there should be enough information in the marketplace for that to happen. But it's really hard to get it right. And what we know is when we have enough women, issues, what I call, come off the table. It was women on both sides of the aisle. You can think how partisan Washington is now. Women on both sides of the aisle said, uh-uh, not OK. Mammograms and pap smears need to be covered. When you get a bipartisan group of women who say something like that, it changes. We're celebrating this year the 20-year anniversary of the uh, NIH Revitalization Act. 20 years ago, it was women on both sides of the aisle who said, we will no longer fund NIH, the National Institute of Health, and their research budget unless women have to be included in clinical drug trials. Mm. And it makes such a difference, such a difference. And um, what can happen is when you have women on both sides of the aisle, issues become nonpartisan. And instead of it being, it's your issue, and now in the United States, women are the majority of voters, or the majority of those registered to vote. We make the majority of purchasing decisions in the United States, even including things like cars. Soon we will be the majority of those with high school, college, and postgraduate degrees. We're the majority of those achieving them now, but there's lots of people from before. And also, let me just note, that is not a great thing that we will be the majority of high school, college, and postgraduate degree holders. Boys are being underserved in schools. It's a problem. And once we finish the business of closing the wage gap, when you begin to imagine the social um, sort of reordering, and the gaps are even larger in communities of color. You know, this is not a good thing. We need schools and systems where every individual, regardless of the lottery of birth, is effectively served. If we're going to meet the challenges and needs of the 21st century, we need an entire workforce that's highly educated and highly trained and effective, not just men or women or boys or girls. So. It's not what our center focuses on. We don't do early education, but note, this is really important. When the league thinks about how kids are doing in schools and looking at those types of issues, it really matters. So we need both men and women up there, and we need men and women who are from different types of groups and organizations. Again, because it's really hard to make policy if you haven't lived that experience. Of the 99 women who were present in the Congress before last uh, two weeks ago election. Does anyone know how many were of color? 30. 30. 30 women of color. Um, and we've had some really exciting firsts that have taken place in the midterms. Now we saw some really big 
um, trends. So normally, what, what demographic groups tend to vote Republican? Does anyone know? Say it again. White men. White men tend to vote Republican in the United States. In this last electoral cycle, we saw a huge jump in the percent by which white men are voting for Republicans. That percent increased. And when we look at the percent of young people who vote for Democrats, that decreased. And we look at the number of women voting for Democrats, that decreased too. Now, midterm elections always tend to be a bit more Republican because more women and young people vote in the presidential cycle. We now have a fully Republican House and Senate. Is that going to be make it harder or easier, do you think, for the Democrats to stay in the White House in the presidential? Harder? Easier? Why easier? Mm -hmm. Why easier? Assuming nothing gets done? Is that especially if nothing gets done. I think that's true. I think that um, it is very hard to be a party that controls both houses and then um, unless they really make something to show for that, uh, that'll really tee it up for someone to come in from the outside and can all be laid at their feet. Now, what might happen in the next electoral cycle that is topical for us tonight? A woman would run, and perhaps a woman would? Win. Yes, and perhaps a woman would win. When you think about suffrage, what demographic group received the right to vote before women? Black men, right? Black men received the right to vote first. And here in the United States, we've now had a black male pr president, which puts us in a position where... No, but quite seriously, I think in terms of the American psyche um, of comfort, there's been a cadence to the, what types of social change occur. Um, and I think we are very likely to be seeing that America is growing in its ability to recognize uh, people who have not been in leadership positions, traditionally in leadership positions, which is really important for our country, regardless of the party, regardless of who gets elected. We can't afford to leave talent on the sidelines. Over the next decade, virtually every major city in the United States is going to be majority minority. Think about that. Every major city in the United States. If we cannot effectively recognize leadership and talent, if it doesn't look a certain way, we will be globally left behind. The larger the nation, the larger the company, the more they understand they have to break down barriers for gender. Saudi Arabia and the Emirates recently have reached out to, the, to us with the work we're doing in Harvard because they're going to need to figure out how do they have enough talent to run and manage their country? Same in Japan. They either need more foreign nationals or they have to shift their cultural norms for women. But those are the choices. There's not enough labor force. And what is driving opportunity for women really is labor force issues. Uh, many people would imagine that there'd be lots of discussions of rights the type of policy center that I run, but predominantly what we talk about during the day is numbers. And major CEOs and corporations understand that if they want to effectively compete in a global marketplace, they're going to need to have supply chains that include women, they need innovation that includes women, and they need to be able to hire and promote their talent. Yes? Except that um, there was a piece down in the news recently that only three women have broken through at the top companies, PepsiCo, um, I'm sure you can listen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, so when you talk about the C-suite, the C-suite's a very interesting place, right? So most, comp so most people aren't CEOs. So let's just start there, regardless of male or female. It's a rare, just like most people aren't president, right? Um, so we still see, and women who end up in C-suite positions, like General Motors, or think Carly Fiorina from Hewlett Packard, so people have all heard of the glass ceiling, right? The gla Yahoo, Melissa Myers. Ginny Brumetti of IBM. Mm -hmm. So glass ceiling is you can see through it, but you can't get through it. So we talk about the glass ceiling in business, and we often talk about the marble ceiling in politics. 
But what's interesting is there's also something called the glass cliff. Really terrific research done, which shows that when women are given CEO opportunities, think GM, think Yahoo, often they're given an opportunity when the company is in a highly precarious situation. And then something else can happen, which is women are then under-resourced. It's not just enough. Let's say I want Dorothy to come in and run a new division. This is going to be one heck of a division. It's going to be challenging and hard. And so I, in my role, say, Dorothy, I want you to run this really big division. It's going to be a really tough job. Now, unless Dorothy is aware that she may be under-resourced, she may not know to say, how many bodies do I get to hire? This is going to be a really tough thing for us to do. So in addition to needing 20 new hires, I'm going to need a broader budget. I need X time horizon. You're not going to be able to evaluate me by in the first two quarters in terms of results that are yielded. Most women say what when they're given the opportunity? Yes, thank you. <laughs> and that kind of ends there. Now, there's also a reason for that. Hannah Riley Bowles at our center is our research director. And you may have read in the papers the concept that women don't ask, and the notion, well, we can just train up the women. There's all this talk, we can train up the women. Once we train the women, we just need women to act more like guys, which is another way of saying women are the problem. Now, of course, this isn't accurate. But so if Ann Mara was going to be hiring someone and I'm applying for the job, and she's just made me an offer, and if I said to her, and Mara, thanks so much for the offer. I think my skills demand 10% more in the marketplace. Could I have that? Now, and I'm Victoria, and I ask that. And if, when I ask that, regardless of if it's a male or female hiring officer, they're less likely to want to work with me after. When women ask for more money or negotiate an offer, people think they're kind of less good women. It breaks with a norm script in the mind of women being relational. And so we were all mulling on that. And Hannah then began to research further and say, you know, if women aren't asking, there must be a reason. It's probably not just that they haven't figured out how to ask. You'd think we would know that, right? Women are pretty good at asking for things. What we realize is when women ask for something on behalf of somebody else, everyone is comfortable. It's a totally appropriate social norm role. But when they ask on behalf of themselves, people think, you know, that's not so nice. They don't seem like lovely women. And so they have to do it in a different way in order for the norm set not to get activated as a conflict. So if I said, Ann Mara, thank you so much for that offer. I would really like to work with you and be on your team. You do such a lovely job here, and it would mean a great deal to me if I could join your group. Do you think we could work on that together? That's terrific, and I would feel more comfortable because I have another offer that's 10% more, but I really would rather be here on your team. Do you think we could do that? Now, do I think women should need to do that? No, absolutely not. But what we know is it works. And in research language, it mitigates social backlash. Women have to cue that they're being relational. Now note, this isn't bad guys keeping women's wages depressed. Again, men and women equally, equally underpay women. Now, does anyone know why that is? <laughs> they can. That's, that's very true. Um, and we're trying to change that. But one of the things that we know is that it's not, it's not that individuals consciously do it. There's implicit and explicit bias, but the majority of it is implicit. And it's because we're all pickled in the culture. It is easy to take the pickle out of the brine. Very, very, very hard to get the brine out of the pickle. <laughs> if anyone can, is anyone with me? It's, it's very difficult, because we're all raised in whatever cultural norm set we're in, and one, tries, one of the ways the mind organizes information is you try to literally replicate what you've seen. It's how you order. And we work on interventions to help change how systems work. We train women on how to navigate the system. Like, that's an example of navigating. We also train and teach on how to fix the system. 
So Thursday, for example, I was in meetings at the White House talking about what are the interventions that could take place over the next 24 months during the presidency to really help things for women. Just like the executive orders and executive actions, because it's unlikely that a lot will get through Congress this cycle, though it's certainly possible that some things will. But it's really about how does one fix the broader system? But because none of you, I imagine, want to wait <laughs> for the whole system to be fixed, we work on interventions to date. But getting back to politics, here in the United States, we are unlikely to have a structural intervention. And structural interventions are what would really shift it. So here we are in 2014. We're about to have the 114th Congress. The highest number of women in the House or Senate we've ever had is now. And we're still below 25% in a nation where women have full access to education and receive the majority of degrees. Challenging. And the Affordable Care Act is an example of how we don't always get it right the first time around. Social Security is another example. The largest group of poor people in the United States is elderly white women. It was not designed to make women poor, but that is absolutely the outcome. It was built on a male work model, and women tend to have more years outside the workforce. As we've talked about, they tend to be paid less than their male counterparts for the same work. Their jobs on the whole tend to be less pensionable. They live longer. They're not always with a spouse or partner, and all of that when you aggregate it, ends up where women, and I'll share a phrase um, from one of the hearings that I chaired as commission, uh, head of the Commission on the Status of Women on the Cape. And a woman stood up, and this really captured what we hear all across the Commonwealth in all 351 cities and towns. She said, I was a good wife, I was a good mother, I was a good employee. I played by the rules my whole life, I wasn't poor in my working years, and I never thought I would be. But now, I'm single. I had stopped working. The recession happened. I don't have enough income now to support myself. Incredibly hard to get a job. People don't want to hire an older woman. And now I'm in a situation where after doing everything that was expected of me, I'm poor. And that is a story we hear over and over and over and over again. And when women take time off uh, to care for loved ones or children and then have taken an off-ramp, when they then take an on-ramp back into the workforce, women tend to be underemployed the rest of their lives. Again, shouldn't be that way. We and others are working to change that, but currently it is that way. And women often don't have this broader data to understand what are the likely outcomes of some of these choices because it's not predominantly covered in the media in an effective way. You know, all those stories about women opting out? The New York Times kind of perennially runs that. It doesn't bear out in the data. When women leave corporate America, um, they're virtually always back within 24 months. It's a really common social narrative to say I'm leaving for family reasons. But what really bears out is they're leaving because they were undervalued, whether that was underpaid or couldn't get the flexibility. And then they go to a competitor or they become entrepreneurs. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I have now talked for quite a while. Um, so I'd love to open up generally for questions on any topic you'd like. Yes. How have you seen women, um, I guess I struggled with this all throughout law school, now afterward it, it's even more apparent, you know, being in the workforce as a lawyer mm -hmm. and working for different firms and different men mm -hmm. um, and women, it seems as if even women in a power role, mm -hmm. let's say, as a government lawyer, mm -hmm. um, for the federal government, I'll say, you know, and a mentor, um, seem to find certain people challenging. You know, if you didn't meet with their norms, or, you know, if you didn't meet their specifications, then you were, you know, challenging them, you know, and they didn't like that. Meaning that they felt you authority challenged them. Right. Well, so one of the things that happens with women it's a really nice experiment that we just did on this. Women expect more of other women, FYI. And just like the example that we role played, and Mara and I, um, there's an expectation of how women are supposed to act. Men have a greater latitude in how they're, in essence, allowed to act without social consequence. And one of the things that we see is there are sort of women um, 
who've gone up through the ranks who pull up the ladder behind them. Um, whenever we look for mentors, people often look for like mentors. I want to find someone who looks like me who's done better. Now, we need mentors and sponsors. Mentors are those that you can go to and ask advice and will help you when you're standing in the room with them. I could go to Joellen and say, Joellen, I've been working in politics. You've been a member of the league and active in town government for a very long time. Advise me on whether you think my skills could be useful in town. And then Joellen could say they are or they aren't or this is how or what to do next and we could talk about it together. And she could give me information from her experience that I don't yet have. There's also sponsors. And let's imagine that I wanted Jean to be my sponsor. That would mean that Jean advocates for me when I am not in the room. And later, when Irene and Jean are having a conversation about who would be good or helpful for the league, Jean would say, that Victoria Budson or that Tommy could really help and play a role. Now, you know how we were talking about the wage gap? What if my social network all looks like me? They're all going to be paid like me, which means I'm going to benchmark my salary expectations against other people who are likely to be seen and perhaps underpaid the same. So even if I get wage transparency among my peers, it doesn't give me the information I need to effectively bargain. So I need sponsors, mentors, and peers where I have shared transparency who do not look like me. Sometimes different fields are harder to pop up, especially with the, you know, in the law, for example, Boston, you know, in the law, the lawyer field, like it's very. Yes, it is. It's, it's challenging. Yeah. I have a friend who's a, an attorney in the Midwest, um, and we grew up as crazy pot smoking hippies in Vermont, <laughs> and um, and she ended up being a um, inventory financing lawyer in the Midwest, and um, the stories of male lawyers. Uh, it's it's a bastion of white male um, con conservativeness, mm -hmm. if that's the right word. Mm -hmm. And the sexual harassment is just beyond anything that I would even have believed. Still. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I, she tells me stories and I can't believe, I can't believe she survived it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so there are certain sections of the country, I think, that are just really, really tough. And what I would say is it's not certain sections of the country. <laughs> So one of the things that I do, um, certainly I do a lot of work here in Massachusetts, but I'm also aware if I'm working on national policy and contributing to that conversation, I need to really understand what women are experiencing and facing and kind of where the rubber meets the road. So recently I was in Tennessee, for example, or I'll be up in Michigan, you know, or anywhere else, because if you really want to understand what's going on, you have to go there. And what I would say is that there isn't any part of the country where there isn't still work to be done. And we're all responsible for it, literally. Not in some kind of figurative way. But in order to reshape the culture, and remember, all the studies bear out that women are equally participatory. You know, we all make culture. We all stand and will say something or not say something when a joke is said. You know, we're all participating in some way in defining what our communities and our states and our nations look like. And certainly those of you who are out here tonight, you know, and who are part of the league are highly participatory. But there's a lot of people who are still thinking about how to be participatory or what that might look like. Um, but it's, it's intense. And one of the things that's important is your friend talked with you about it. What's very important is that we talk about what takes place. I believe that any gap we can measure, we can close. Any gap we can measure, we can close. But if we can't measure it, there is no way we're going to be able to muster the tools and resources and understand the levers to close it. And talking about it is the first thing towards it. And Mark? So I guess I'm so switching back to the politics piece mm -hmm. of it. So here in Wellesley, by observation, it seems that if most people running for office today, they're women. They're okay. Women in our town. And for the library, it's been a while since we've had a man who run for a job library. By the way, we'd love to have made around him, you know, somebody. <laughs> but um, I wondered if, I guess I'm wondering if that, if that's happening at sort of a town level across Massachusetts, mm. yeah. and if that would then filter up to a state level that would then filter, you know, yeah. that yeah. way yeah. have transition. Well, that is a great question, and let's talk about that. I don't know if that's a phenomenon happening throughout the 351 cities and towns in the Commonwealth, but what I can tell you is this. 
So when we look at the Senate, we currently have 20%. When we look at the House, we have 18.5%. When we look at the state legislatures, 24.5%. And I'm sure if we went to town meetings, it would be a higher proportion of women. Now, what happens when one goes up the ladder to higher offices? M more or fewer women? Fewer. Fewer. Yeah. Except for towns, as you say. Well, the well towns, it's the more grassroots. The more the political jobs become high status and high wage, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the more interested entrants into the candidacies are men. Are men. So one of the things that happens is as something becomes more prized, we see more men vying for them. Now, this is changing. It's changing. It's getting better, which is good. Um, but I think often women, so what the research shows is that women run to solve a problem. Women rarely wake up in the morning and say, I think I'm going to run today just because I think I'm great and want to do it. Now, I wish more women woke up and said that. Joellen said that she would run for president, right? That that would be her interested post. I wish that Joellen would wake up and decide to run for president. Women tend to do two things. They wait to be asked, and on average, women need to be asked how many times before they want to run. Does anyone know? Three to seven. Three to seven. So the first thing, I ask each of you to run for office. Which now means you can also, someone from Harvard asked me to run, right? Like, that's where you want to begin. But truly, each of you needs to think about who are the smart, competent women you know. Ask them to run, repeatedly and consistently. So one of the things that happens is women are more interested in running for the lower offices. And for example, Amara, you're super active and participate in all kinds of things. Have you ever considered running for state rep or state senate? No. How many people think she'd be great at that? Yeah, look at the room. Yeah. I'm asking you to consider it. That's okay. We could all take them out, it'd be fine. Some cookies, tell them it'll be all right. Who are married and have young children, it's more difficult for them to leave their surroundings. I mean, they could engage in the town politics, but to get to the state level or the federal level, I would think that would be the most challenging for them. It's easier for a man, as my friend Susan mentioned, to um, go to Washington, D.C. and well, leave the family back at home. So let's explore so, that. Yeah. Does anyone know how many children Bill Weld had when he? was running for office? I thought it was five. But, 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 but it was some. It was some number, four or five. Now, how many times do you think people wondered if Bill Weld could both be governor and have kids? Nobody. Now, the majority of households with children in Boston are single female head of households. Majority, the majority. When we think about what it will take, now we often, Dorothy talked to, and Susan talked about saying that we often think about and hear, which is how could she do it with small kids? But most women need to go out and participate in some type of paid labor or participate in some type of volunteer labor. <laughs> So it's not that women are actually sitting in their homes all the time just raising their kids, which, by the way, is a perfectly valid and fantastic choice. But there's something that happens in all of our minds when it then becomes political. And the press tends to focus on what we call haircuts, hemlines, and husbands. <laughs> and so if she's married, but doesn't have kids, often the stories will be like, why doesn't she have kids? What does that mean? One of the students that I trained who was elected to state rep, um, who just came up and spoke in my class this week, she talked about people would say, well, we don't know if you, know, you could vote effectively on education because you don't have any kids. <laughs> and she said, you know, I did go to Harvard. I think I know a little bit about education. 
And I'm from a large family, and I went through the school system here. And if she had kids, people would say, you should be at home with your kids. So if you don't have kids, it can be hard. And if you do have kids, it can be hard. And if you're just about to have kids, it can be hard. And there's, you know, women are always asked to kind of walk this line. And my students often want to know where the line is and how to walk it. And what I say is, don't worry about it, because they're going to move the line. <laughs> they're going to move the line. And what you have to remember is that the majority of voters in the United States are women. I have a question on that, though. Mm. Women, I think Hillary Clinton probably has looked at this. Uh, women can be women's worst enemy. They say, who does she think she is? I'm not voting for her. Um, I think that's a line that, I mean, we had a lot of women live and women, women hugging each other and everything, but there's still that factor. Well, so what we find in the research is a couple things. So one, really hard to get elected without a big chunk of the women's vote. Yeah. It's not going to happen. And now, the largest group of women who vote are women who are seniors. Older women tend to break more Republican than Democrat. It'll be interesting to see as the next generation's age, whether that stays or whether Democratic-leaning younger women. That's really interesting, though, in light of what you said about the largest group of poor women being older white women, that they would then vote Republican. Poor women tend to vote more Republican. Hmm. Older poor women, yeah. Hmm. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, it's interesting, but, but to Joellen's point, women can be very hard on other women. There's a lot of expectation that can shift by organization, demographic. I think, in part, women expect more of other women. Um, and just like I talked about, you know, the hiring and how it's the same in terms of underpayment, I think people can expect that it will be different, but guess what? People are really people. People are really people. You know, people vote their interests. You know, people are always, will, you know, reporters will call, what's the women's vote going to do? You know, in the last cycles, they're going to vote about the economy. What do you think they're going to do? You know, this is where we are. Women know their issues. And women very effectively look at the candidates and think, who's going to better represent my issues? Um, and women aren't a monolithic group. You know, people often talk about the wage gap. And I often talk about the wage gaps. White women compared to the white male dollar are making about 77 cents. African American women compared to the white male dollar make about 66 cents. And I want you to imagine wherever you sit when you pay your bills. Literally think about it. Now imagine you're a Latina woman and you're making 54 cents on the white male dollar for the same job. And how in the world you're going to pay for your heat pay for the needs of your kids, pay for food, and save anything. And that was a conversation we were having earlier today. And tomorrow I'll be up at the State House, and I have three meetings tomorrow, one with the Governor, one with the Senate President, one with the Speaker of the House, to talk about issues having to do with the Women's Commission and to talk about the latest research. But what's really important is that people are talking about these issues all the time. Not sometimes, not once a year, not on occasion but to really focus in on how is it that we're going to close these gaps. Because how sustainable is it to make 54 cents in the dollar? And the thing about the wage gap is you can't inoculate yourself from it. You can't get a bunch of education and then think, well, I'm highly educated. The more highly educated a woman is, the larger the gap. The larger the gap. When you're in a low wage job, a minimum wage job, you're going to be paid hourly and you're likely to be paid the same or pretty close to the guy next to you. But the higher up you get, law firms are a really good example, where compensation and what you're worth really is defined by what your supervisor thinks, point blank, period. And once you're in the rarefied ranks, senior VP, upper level management, the C-suite, the level of discretion is so broad and the numbers to peg against are so few that people can make all kinds of different cases and there's not a statistically significant enough number to compare against and women really do poorly there. Well, maybe I'm not as qualified. 
Perhaps not. <laughs> so, okay. and how, can I ask what are some of the better, what are some of the interventions on the better level you were talking about in the White House that, that you can disclose to us? Like, what are some of the sure. initiatives you're thinking about? Um, I'll tell you one of the things I'm very aware of right now. Anytime we pass a law or an executive order, it may guide behavior. If we say that federal contractors will be penalized if any worker who's working on a federal contract um, has disclosed wages to another, you can no longer fire that person nor penalize them. So that may guide behavior more generally, because what we know is wage transparency, that um, wage gaps are a problem that you know you put daylight in them and they go away. Daylight really helps solve the problem, as does standard practices and norms. The, the city in the US that has most closed the wage gap is Washington DC because of all the federal employees. It's very clear what the jobs pay. There's very little discretion. People get it wrong. This is a place where good systems can really solve a problem. So when we're looking at what's possible, what I'm aware of is when we pass a law, very often action only happens if that law is breached someone becomes aware of the breach and then sues. And then think of the class action suit uh, that was against Walmart and then Walmart won. What kind of signal does that send? So my board was in town two weeks ago. We have a lot of corporations in the board. And if we talk to corporations about the phenomenon of women being underpaid, the importance of the fact that the talent market is shifting female, how once you've hired an employee, if you cannot effectively promote and retain that employee, you are not yielding a good ROI on that investment. So if you want the best talent and you don't want your talent going someplace else, you need to make sure that women are getting those stretch assignments and are getting promoted. And when I looked around my table of corporations who support our work and our research, what I'm aware of is it's not that they represent one or two women in their workforce. The size of the workforce represented around that table is roughly five million people. So if companies uptake interventions, that can impact five million workers right then. And if the administration changes and goes Democrat or goes Republican, those five million employees still have access to whatever that intervention was. And as we think about the way the world works, the partnerships with the White House and with major multinationals are going to be incredibly important in terms of thinking about how many people can be affected and what life looks like. Because the other thing that happens is the lower wage somebody is, obviously, the fewer resources they have, um, an ease that they're going to have discretionary time, money, effort, and access to information to then go and sue, right? We're also working, one of our fellows is working um, on the EEOC and what data is collected. We don't have wage data that's currently collected. Um, but you know, we're also going to see regulation, I think, not anytime soon in the US, but there's a lot taking place in Europe, which I think will eventually. Um, those norms will reach here as well, where you have to have a minimum number of women on boards. There's going to be more pressure to, in essence, um, break open what have been sort of culturally barriered um, governance and you know the studies are really clear the broader diversity you have when you're making complex decisions that's diversity of all kinds different races different ages different fields you know diverse groups solve complex decisions much more effectively yes usually though when you do that when you bring an issue to light there's always a backlash sure and I guess I'm a little bit afraid, you know, now that they we're talking about making steps, that there's going to be a backlash, and it's going to, like a rubber band, it's going to smack. Um, <laughs> and there, people will use maybe, I'm just throwing it out as a lawyer, the equal opportunity, you know, clause, and say, well, we don't discriminate based on age, gender, race, ancestry, you know, history, whatever, you know, I'm sorry, you know, we, we didn't pick you because, you, you know, or we can't pick you because you're, you're a female versus a male. Versus you can't. I mean, one of the interesting things is, is you can't, um, you know, we have protected classes and we have those who aren't in protected classes. Um, you can't hire someone because they're a man or because they're a woman. But you can't discriminate against them based on gender either. No, you can't. 
You can't. Um, so I think there will be backlash, but I don't think it will be backlash in the law. I certainly think you know, there may be some, it's very common when the administration changes that some executive orders get overturned. Like the 1984 Mexico City policy that meant any federal dollars which went um, to a health institution abroad um, from the US meant that that um, health facility could not discuss issues of abortion um, in their family planning. But you know, as soon as Clinton came in, he took it away. And then when Bush came in, put it back. Um, so there's, you know, there's those types of things. And in order for, for women to have equality anywhere in the world, there are only two things which are required. And without these two things, in my view, it's not possible. The first is statutory protection under the law. Women's ability to vote, women's ability to own land, women's right to bodily integrity, women's right to credit, all of the statutory protections. Every statutory protection, it's always a game of vigilance and management, meaning there's no irrevocable right. Constitutions get rewritten, nations rise and fall, it has to be enforced, so one can never say, oh, we now have that. There's no concern. And there's a tendency to do that, but it, it's erroneous. It's an error. It's a game of vigilance. And the second is that women must have the ability to economically sustain themselves and their dependents over the arc of their adult life, whether or not they choose to exercise that. But if a woman can't walk out of her situation and take care of herself and her dependents, she is not going to be equal or free. She will be in a situation where she will have compromise or coercion and it requires women's ability to have both of those things to be free, whether you're in Sub-Saharan Africa or whether you're in the Netherlands, you know, or whether you're sitting in Cambridge. And so that's why it's so important to make sure that women are elected because women's statutory rights predominantly will be best understood, maintained, and written into the law when there's women there to ensure it. And I look forward to the day when Descriptive representation is totally not needed, but we haven't reached that day yet today. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you.